Chapter thirty four of the UP Trail by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The home to which Allie Lee was brought stood in the outskirts of Omaha upon a wooded bank above the river. Allie watched the broad yellow Missouri swirling by. She liked best to be alone outdoors in the shade of the trees. In the weeks since her arrival there, she had not recovered from the shock of meeting Neale, only to be parted from him. But the comfort, the luxury of her home, the relief from constant dread, such as she had known for years, the quiet at night, these had been so welcome, so saving, that her burden of sorrow seemed endurable. Yet in time she came to see that the finding of a father and a home had only added to her bitterness. Allison Lee's sister, an elderly woman of strong character, resented the home-bringing of this strange lost daughter. Allie had found no sympathy in her. For a while, neighbors and friends of the Lees flocked to the house and were kind, gracious, attentive to Allie. Then somehow her story, or part of it, became gossip. Her father, sensitive, cold, embittered by the past, suffered intolerable shame at the disgrace of a wife's desertion and a daughter's notoriety. Allie's presence hurt him. He avoided her as much as possible. The little kindnesses that he had shown and his feelings of pride in her beauty and charm soon vanished. There was no love between them. Allie had tried hard to care for him, but her heart seemed to be buried in that vast grave of the West. She was obedient, beautiful, passive, but she could not care for him. And there came a day when she realized that he did not believe she had come unscathed through the wilds of the gold fields and the vileness of the construction camps. She bore this patiently, though it stung her. But the loss of respect for her father did not come until she heard men in his study, loud-voiced and furious, wrangle over contracts and accuse him of double-dealing. Later he told her that he had become involved in financial straits, and that unless he could raise a large sum by a certain date he would be ruined. And it was this day that Allie sat on a bench in the little arbor and watched the turbulent river. She was sorry for her father, but she could not help him. Moreover, alien griefs did not greatly touch her. Her own grief was deep and all-enfolding. She was heart-sick and always yearning, yearning for that she dared not name. The day was hot, sultry, no birds sang, but the locusts were noisy, the air was full of humming bees. Allie watched the river. She was idle because her aunt would not let her work. She could only remember and suffer. The great river soothed her. Where did it come from, and where did it go? And what was to become of her? Almost it would have been better. A servant interrupted her. Missy, here's a gem to see you, announced the Negro girl. Allie looked. She thought she saw a tall, buckskin-clad man carrying a heavy pack. Was she dreaming, or had she lost her mind? She got up, shaking in every limb. This tall man moved. He seemed real. His bronzed face beamed. He approached. He set the pack down on the bench. Then his keen, clear eyes pierced Allie. Well, lass, he said gently. The familiar voice was no dream, no treachery of her mind. Slinger. She could not speak. She could hardly see. She swayed into his arms. Then when she felt the great, strong clasp and the softness of buckskin on her face and the odor of pine and sage and desert dust, she believed in his reality. Her heart seemed to collapse. All within her was riot. Neil, she whispered in anguish. All right, and working hard. He sent me replied Slingerland, swift to get his message out. Allie quivered and closed her eyes and leaned against him. A beautiful something pervaded her soul. Slowly the tumult within her breast subsided. She recovered. Uncle Al, she called him tenderly. Well, I should smile. And glad to see you. Why, Lord, I'd never tell you. 
You're white and shaky, lass. Sit down here on the bench beside me. There. Allie, I've a powerful lot to tell you. Wait. To see you and to hear of him almost killed me with joy, she panted. Her little hands, once so strong and brown, but now thin and white, fastened tight in the fringe of his buckskin hunting coat. Lass, sight of you sort of makes me young again. But, Allie, those are not the happy eyes I remember. I am very unhappy, she whispered. Well, if that ain't too bad. Sure, it's natural you'd be downhearted losing Neil that way. It's not all that she murmured and then she told him well well ejaculated the trapper stroking his beard in thoughtful sorrow but i reckon that's natural too you're a strange here and that story will hang over you lass with all due respects to your father i reckon you'd better come back to me and neil did he tell you to say that she whispered tremulously lord no ejaculated slingerland does he care for me still lass he's dying for you and i never spoke a truer word allie shuddered close to him blinded stormed by an exquisite bittersweet fury of love she seemed rising uplifted filled with rich strong joy i forgave him she murmured dreamily low to herself well maybe you'll be right glad you did presently said slingerland with animation especially when there wasn't nothing much to forgive allie became mute she could not lift her eyes lass listen began slingerland after you left roaring city neil went at hard work began by heaving ties and rails and now he's slinging a sledge this was amazing to me i seen him only once since and that uh, was the other day but i heard about him i rode over to roaring city several times and i made it my business to find out about neil he never came into the town at all he said he worked like a slave that first day bleeding hard but he couldn't be stopped and the work didn't kill him though there were some as swore it would they said he changed and when he toughened up there was never but one man as could equal him and that was an irish fellow named casey i heard it was something worth while to see him sling a sledge well i never seen him do it but maybe i will yet a few days back i met him getting off a train at roaring city lord i hardly knowed him he stood like an injun with big muscles bulging, and his face was clean and dark, his eye like fire. He nearly shook a daylight out of me. Slingerland, I want you, he kept yelling at me. And I said, so it appears, but what fair? Then he told me he was going after the gold that Horn had buried along the old Laramie Trail. Well, I took my outfit, and we rode back into the hills. You remember them. Well, we found the gold, easy enough, and we packed it back to Roaring City. There, Neil sent me off on a train to fetch the gold to you. And here I am, and there's the gold. Allie stared at the pack, bewildered by Slingerland's story. Suddenly she sat up. She felt the blood rush to her cheeks. Gold? Horn's gold? But it's not mine. Did Neil send it to me? Every ounce, replied the trapper soberly. I reckon it's yours. There was no one else left. And you recollect what Horn said. Lass, it's yours. And I'm going to make you keep it. How much is there? queried Allie, with thrills of curiosity. How well she remembered Horn. He had told her he had no relatives. Indeed, the gold was hers. Well, Neil and me couldn't calculate how much, having nothing to weigh the gold, but it's a fortune. Allie turned from the pack to the earnest face of the trapper. There had been many critical moments in her life, but never one with the suspense, the fullness, the inevitableness of this. Did Neil send anything else? She flashed. 
Well, yes, and I was coming to that, replied Slingerland, as he unlaced the front of his hunting frock. Presently he drew forth a little leather notebook, which he handed to Allie. She took it while looking up at him. Never had she seen his face radiate such strange emotion. She divined it to be the supreme happiness inherent in the power to give happiness. Allie trembled. She opened the little book. Surely it would contain a message that would be as sweet as life to dying eyes. She read a name written in ink in a clear script. Beauty Stanton. Her pulses ceased to beat, her blood to flow, her heart to throb. All seemed to freeze within her except her mind, and that leaped fearfully over the first lines of a letter, then feverishly on to the close, only to fly back and read again. Then she dropped the book. She hid her face on Slingerland's breast. She clutched him with frantic hands. She clung there, her body all held rigid, as if some extraordinary strength or inspiration or joy had suddenly inhibited weakness. Well, lass, you're taking it powerful hard, and I made sure. Hush, whispered Allie, raising her face. She kissed him. Then she sprang up like a bent sapling released. She met Slingerland's keen gaze, saw him start, then rise as if the better to meet a shock. I'm going back west with you, she said coolly. Well, I knowed you'd go. Divide that gold. I'll leave half to my father. Slingerland's great hands began to pull at the pack. There's a train soon. I calculated to stay over a day, but the sooner the better. Lass, will you run off or tell him? I'll tell him. He can't stop me even if he would. The gold will save him from ruin. He will let me go. She stooped to pick up the little leather notebook and placed it in her bosom. Her heart seemed to surge against it. The great river rolled on, rolled on, magnified in her sight. A thick, rich, beautiful light shone under the trees. What was this dance of her blood while she seemed so calm, so cool, so sure? Does he have any idea that I might return to him? she asked. None, lass, none. That I'll swear, declared Slingerland. When I left him at Roaring City the other day, he was... Well, like he used to be. The boy come out in him again, not just the same, but brave. Sending that gold and that little book made him happy. I reckon Neil found his soul then, and he never expects to see you again in this here world. End of chapter 34